Dr. Phil expresses concern over the rise of trans discussions among children, attributing it to social media and activist agendas. He questions the legitimacy of claims about a surge in transgender identification, suggesting a social contagion effect. The discussion highlights potential detransitioners and the lack of reporting on this matter. Dr. Phil emphasizes the importance of professionals in child psychology or medicine handling such cases, criticizing teachers' involvement without proper training. Don't miss, what is the social contagion effect, and how does it contribute to the rise in transgender issues? What are Dr. Phil's concerns regarding irreversible actions taken by individuals influenced by activists? How does Joe Rogan question the pressure and terminology surrounding life-saving gender-affirming care? What do you I'm think is behind it, though? Like, what? How did this? If it, this is so contrary to the way most people feel, what do you think is behind it? Especially the push towards children, affirming children. Do you think it's because there's people that are queer or LBGT, whatever, and they want other people to be a part of their their group? Is it they want more LBGT people? They want to encourage this behavior. They think it's suppressed, and maybe there's more people that are gay or whatever and they want to come out and they just get suppressed by it so they're trying to make it like more enthusiastic like how is how is this trans thing becoming a major point of debate with children where it never has in history in your life in my life there was never all this talk about trans children like this it seems insane that we've forgotten that kids don't know what the fuck is going on yet this seems insane that we've forgotten that kids don't know what the fuck is going on yet Using the term insane raises concerns about children's well-being and understanding. It suggests that kids may not be ready to deal with complex ideas like those related to gender identity. I think a lot of it is owing to social media platforms and the internet. I think a lot of it is owing to social media platforms and the internet. Transgender topics are gaining traction online and on social media platforms. Surprisingly, External factors have a stronger influence on how children view gender than their own feelings or self-exploration. I think um, this is what I'm talking about when I say the activist, I don't think speak for the community at large. I think they get an agenda that they're pushing. I don't think they speak for the community at large. I think they get an agenda that they're pushing. Understanding the concept allows us to empathize with activists who push for particular agendas. It raises concerns about accurately representing the wider community's views and worries while striving to ensure the welfare of children. And I think they really get wrapped up in this, and it gets a lot of oxygen on the Internet. It gets a lot of oxygen on social media platform. Now, they say there's no social contagion here, but the girls that are claiming to be transgender, that percentage has gone up. Some reports say it's gone up. Um, 800 percent, 1,000 percent over the last several years, and they say, well, that's because they feel more comfortable talking about it now. Is that true, or is it because you read about it, you see it on social media, and you think, well, I can distinguish myself in this way? I think there is a social contagion effect, so people jump on the bandwagon. I think there is a social contagion effect. So people jump on the bandwagon, Using terms like social contagion and jumping on the bandwagon shows empathy toward people who might be influenced by others or peer pressure instead of examining their true feelings about gender identity on their own. And if it's for a short period of time, but they've done things that can't be reversed, I think that's really tragic. But they've done things that can't be reversed. I think that's really tragic. The term tragic conveys empathy towards individuals who, influenced by external factors, make irreversible decisions with potential negative outcomes. And they say there are very few detransitioners. I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot more detransitioners that want to reverse this and come back than are being reported. Dr. Phil expresses apprehension regarding the societal influence on gender identity formation among the youth, suggesting that the surge in transgender identification might stem more from exposure to social media and the Internet than from authentic self-discovery. This presents a challenge to the foundational comprehension of external factors' impact on shaping identity and individual decision-making. Dr. Phil probes into the motives behind driving the identification of children's gender identity, questioning whether advocates for transgender ideology genuinely represent the broader community. This sparks a contemplation on the tension between an individual's authenticity and the societal pressure to align with a specific ideology or agenda. 
Both Dr. Phil and Joe Rogan advocate for critical thinking and discernment, especially when navigating online information. They delve into the role of social media and the internet in shaping attitudes towards transgender issues, particularly among the younger demographic. Dr. Phil raises ethical concerns about irreversible actions stemming from regrettable decisions and questions the appropriateness of medical interventions for minors. The discourse centers on the importance of informed consent before implementing interventions with the potential for lifelong consequences. Joe Rogan, on the other hand, queries the abrupt emergence of transgender issues and their impact on children grappling with understanding their identity. He interprets this phenomenon as a delicate balance between raising awareness, fostering authenticity, and the potential risks associated with encouraging early identification or irreversible behavior. It's, I just don't understand where the pressure is coming from. Another phrase they're using now is life-saving gender-affirming care. They like to p smash them all together like that. Well, I, I don't think it's that... Uh, I just don't think that there's evidence to... Well, I don't think that. I just don't think that there's evidence to suggest that's true. Dr. Phil voices skepticism about claims of life-saving gender, affording care, stirring democratic concerns about potential overreach. He advocates for a cautious approach, emphasizing decision-making based on evidence. Suggest that's true. Is this Here the guy is. you're talking yeah. about? He said there's no such thing as parental rights in Canada. Children have rights in Canada, and those kinds of policies restrict the rights children have. This is a wild thing, man. It's, well, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. But America's not far behind that because no. I've, I've talked to a lot of teachers, and they're telling me that they have a duty to the children, that if the child is not ready to talk to their parents about this, that it's okay for them to keep a secret from the child. Now, they have a duty to the children that if the child is not ready to talk to their parents about this, that it's okay for them to keep a secret from the child. Dr. Phil challenges the idea that educators should keep information from parents and emphasizes the significance of openness within families. He discusses transparency and the risk of disrupting parent-child relationships, underscoring the crucial role and rights parents have in influencing their children's development. Let me tell you what my problems with this are and see what you think. Um, first off, if this is either a psychological phenomenon or a medical phenomenon and the teachers are not trained in either psychology or medicine. They're not any more trained to deal with that than they are to take out the kid's spleen in the homeroom. So if that's true, if it's a psychological thing, if it's, if it's gender dysphoria, or it's a, it's a medical uh, issue, then you need someone trained in child psychology, psychiatry, or medicine. And the teacher's not trained in any of those three things. Like I say, they're not any more trained in that than they are to take out the child's spleen. So how are they qualified to deal with that? And the teacher's not trained in any of those three things. Like I say, they're not any more trained in that than they are to take out the child's spleen. So how are they qualified to deal with that? The common belief is that educators might not have the expertise in psychology, psychiatry, or medicine necessary to deal with potentially complex psychological or medical issues concerning a child's gender identity Therefore, it is suggested that a specially trained professional should be responsible for addressing these issues. Secondly, it's teaching the child to keep a secret from their parents. It's teaching deception and interfering between the child's relationship with their parent. Secondly, it's teaching the child to keep a secret from their parents. It's teaching deception and interfering between the child's relationship with their parent argues in favor of prioritizing open communication within families over psychologists' concerns about the negative consequences of children keeping their parents' secrets. It questions the potential harm to family cohesion caused by external interventions from governments and society. Now, their issue, with their, their justification for that is, well, if the child goes home and announces this, or if we tell it to the parent, then the child could get abused, the child could get judge, the child could get kicked to the curb. Uh, but they have to admit, statistically, that that is very rare. And if that's the case, that's what we have child uh, Department of Child and Family Services for. That's what we have Child Protective Services for. If that's the case, then you call in for some intervention if the child is being abused at home for whatever reason. Uh, then you get intervention in that way. But you don't come between the child and their parent. The parent has the right to know what's going on. The parent has the right to know what's going on. 
In the complex realm of parental rights, especially regarding sensitive issues such as gender identity, I firmly believe that parents have the inherent right to be informed and involved in decisions that impact their children. Dr. Phil sheds light on the influence of social media and activist agendas in the growing conversation around transgender issues among children. He raises valid concerns about potential detransitioners and challenges the qualification of teachers in handling psychological or medical matters. The public is encouraged to question the pressure behind pushing trans ideology on kids and the consequences of lacking expertise in dealing with such sensitive issues within the educational system. Dr. Phil expresses concerns regarding teachers' involvement in matters related to gender identity, highlighting that educators may lack adequate training to address psychological or medical issues. Emphasizing the importance of respecting parental rights and relying on highly trained professionals for psychological and medical problem solving is crucial. Dr. Phil questions the practice of teaching children to keep secrets from their parents, emphasizing the potential ethical issues and harm associated with withholding information from parents and undermining their authority. The potential consequences of gaslighting and brainwashing on a child's physical and mental health are a serious consideration. Is it justifiable for Dr. Phil to advocate for keeping secrets from parents, citing concerns about potential abuse or rejection? This raises ethical dilemmas about guiding children towards a fulfilling life while respecting parental rights. The significance of maintaining open communication between parents and children, even in challenging circumstances, challenges the legitimacy of such justifications. Dr. Phil raises doubts about using this justification to conceal statistically confidential cases of abuse or parental rejection, prompting ethical inquiries about balancing child protection with parental rights and responsibilities. Dr. Phil suggests that in cases of potential abuse or mistreatment at home, appropriate intervention should be sought through institutions such as child protection services rather than teachers intervening and concealing information from parents drawing a clear line between valid concerns for child welfare and unwarranted interference in parental rights and responsibilities is imperative. What do you think? I promote myself and my videos. Hello, I'm Bong Sim, a Canadian resident of Asian descent. During the day, I work as a professional counselor, and at night, I do Uber food delivery. Instead of speaking in my videos, I prefer to express myself through writing. In today's world, speaking the truth can have serious consequences, both for my professional life and personal well-being. That's why I'm choosing to pen down my thoughts and using a platform to share them on my behalf. Some people find my videos uninteresting, too strict, and they even criticize the appearance of the individuals featured, including their tiredness, Asian, or perceived flaws. I understand these concerns, but I genuinely believe in the purpose behind creating these videos. Unfortunately, recent Canadian legislation has resulted in the censorship of free speech and online content, and although Google hasn't explicitly admitted their involvement, I suspect they play a part in it. Despite my efforts to monetize my content on YouTube, I haven't been able to earn any income from it. I've tried three times, and all my attempts were rejected. They turned me down for reasons like lacking creativity, not having a recognizable face, or not having a distinct voice. Nevertheless, I've made several adjustments to my videos, hoping to overcome these challenges. If you share my belief and support what I'm doing, I would genuinely appreciate your backing.